Before I begin my sermon, I would invite you to turn to the Bible, to Hosea chapter 11. I know this is a strange request for a minister, a Presbyterian minister, to ask a Presbyterian congregation to open up the Bible. But I'm actually going to preach from chapter 11 of Hosea. It's one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. Yet, you don't hear many sermons on the 11th chapter of Hosea. And hopefully after the sermon, you'll understand why it is so important and how that theme in Hosea chapter 11 is taken up by Jesus of Nazareth. So let's begin. In the 1960s, it was popular for students and professors at college to say, God is dead. Theologians even wrote books about it. God is dead. In part, what they meant was that in a modern society, one no longer needs to believe as the ancient people in myths, and one no longer needs to believe um, in a God, a supernatural deity, to explain natural phenomena. We, we have science for that. And, and, and psychology teaches us that one no longer needs to believe in a supernatural deity ready to pounce the minute you do something wrong. As if God's anger needs to be appeased. And so it was quite fashionable on college campuses to say, God is dead. William Sloan Coffin was a chaplain at Yale University. And William Sloan Coffin made his mark at Yale in leading the anti-war movement uh, during the Vietnam War. And later, he was one of the principal leaders for the disarmament of nuclear weapons, uh, the SANE movement. He later became a pastor, senior pastor at Riverside Church in New York City. William Sloan Coffin was an amazing prophet, teacher, pastor, Christian. When he was at Yale and a college student would come into his office and say, I no longer believe in God. God is dead. William Sloan Coffin didn't begin with saying, no, he's not. He began with these words. Tell me about the God that you don't believe in. Maybe I don't believe in that God either. And thus began a conversation rather than an argument. The writer of Hosea would probably agree with Dr. Coffin's approach for you see, the first 10 chapters of Hosea, God is angry with Israel. God is angry with Israel because Israel once again has forsaken the covenant with idolatry and immorality. Idolatry by worshiping other gods like the God of Baal and immorality by forsaking the poor. And so God is angry, and God is going to use the Assyrians. At that time was the big bully in the Middle East. The Assyrians, and their capital was in Nineveh, around 725 B.C. Nineveh, which is modern-day Iraq. 
The Assyrians was the big bully in the block, and God was going to use the Assyrians to punish Israel for its waywardness. God likens the relationship that God has with Israel to that of an unfaithful spouse. And like your typical man in a patriarchal society in the Middle East back in those days, when you had an unfaithful spouse, it brought shame on the married person and on the married person's family and community. And for the sake of honor, the evildoer must be punished. And so you hear about that in the first 10 chapters of what God is going to do to Israel because it's played the role of an unfaithful spouse. But then something happens in chapter 11 that changes everything. And it begins in verse 8. Are you with me? How can I give you up, God says to Ephraim, another name for Israel? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma, which was totally obliterated by the Assyrians? How can I treat you like Zeboim, another town that was obliterated by the Assyrians? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal. The Holy One in your midst, I will not come in wrath. Did you hear that? And the question is, what changed? What changed God's heart that God's not willing to execute his anger, but God decides to take it inward? Did Israel repent? Say, God, I promise not to do that ever again. No, Israel didn't repent. Then what changed? God did. God changes in chapter 11. And what changes is a metaphor. A metaphor changes everything. For the sake of a metaphor, God sees things in a new perspective. No longer does God compare God's relationship with Israel as an unfaithful spouse or a wayward spouse, God compares God's relationship with Israel Israel as a wayward son. And that changes everything. No longer must honor be avenged. Instead, love must be remembered. God remembers when Israel took her first steps. God remembers when Israel learned to ride a bicycle. God remembers when Israel learned to drive a stick ship. It didn't say that exactly. I'm paraphrasing. If you look at verse 3, you'll hear where I got the paraphrase. God said, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of life. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. God remembers. I can remember when my dad taught me to drive a stick ship. 
It was a 1966 blue Mustang. He thought if you needed to learn to drive, you needed to learn to drive a stick shift. We had automatic cars, but my dad felt like I needed to learn to drive a stick shift. And so he gives me the vintage 1966 blue Mustang to learn to drive. I was scared. And he takes me out to a neighborhood that's at the bottom of this hill it was a forsaken neighborhood. It was not, there weren't going to be cars coming and honking. And, and he takes me on this hill. And he gets out and he tells me to get in. And he puts it in park in the emergency brake on. And he tells me he wants me to find that equilibrium spot. Where the car doesn't roll back. Where the car doesn't lurch forward where you don't have to use the gas or the brake to keep it on that heel idling. After many hiccups, <coughs> you know, and lunging forward, I think probably after 30 minutes, I finally found that spot of equilibrium. And I looked at my father's face. He was smiling from ear to ear. That was one of those MasterCard moments. That's what Hosea's talking about. For the sake of a metaphor, it puts everything in a new perspective. Israel is no longer the wayward spouse. Israel is the wayward son. Honor must not be avenged. Instead, love must be remembered. It's interesting that Jesus talks about this God who is like a parent. And God understands the pain of a child who goes his or her own way and forsakes all that the family has taught. One of the great stories in the New Testament that Jesus teaches in the book, in the Gospel of Luke, is the story of the prodigal. Some say the prodigal story is the gospel in a nutshell. Karl Barth says it, and I believe it. And what makes that story remarkable is this, that the prodigal comes to his father and says, give me my share of inheritance. What the son is actually saying to the father is, you're dead to me. Did you hear that? You're dead to me, but I can't wait till you die. So go ahead and give me my share and you'll never see me again. Most Middle Eastern fathers would not have given the son the inheritance, would made him wait until he died. But this father gives the son his share, his portion, and we know what the son does with it. But then the son comes to his senses and goes back to his father. Now, the father is kind of waiting, like in the south on the front porch, waiting for the son to return, the prodigal to return. And from a distance, he can see the long lost son, the son that's dead to him, coming back. And what makes this story remarkable is this. The father doesn't wait till the son comes all the way back up to the front steps and apologizes and repents and grovels. No, this father runs out to meet his son, something a Middle Eastern father would never do on account of shame. It would be a shameful act for the father to do that. He has his honor to protect. But in this story, 
This father cares nothing for his honor, cares everything for his son and his daughter. And he says, that which is dead is now alive. He welcomes the prodigal home, kills the fatted calf. We learn something about God. Jesus says, God is like that. God is waiting for us to come to our senses. God is waiting for us to come home, to be embraced and loved and forgiven that we might become whole. So if you were to ask me, do I believe in a supernatural deity that must be appeased because, or else his anger is ready to break out on us? The answer is no. This God that is vengeful needs to die. And may he rest in peace. But if you were to ask me, do I believe in the God that has been revealed in Jesus Christ, who's willing to take the pain of rejection inward so that we are given a chance to come home, to be loved and forgiven? The answer is yes. Yes. And so, my question to you is this. Do you believe in this God who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you that you might have life and all of its abundance? And that this God is waiting for sinners to come home, to know the joy of being in relationship with God, to know the joy of being loved. God loves us so much that he promises not to leave us as we are, but God loves us so much that God promises to change us so that we might learn to love as He loves. In a day and age where people will kill in God's name, this God needs to die. And the God who died for us and was raised for us needs to be received so that the world might know a God whose honor does not need to be avenged, but a love that only needs to be remembered. Do this in remembrance of me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.